So here we are in Kuala Lumpur on the 6th of November, 2022, post-COVID, or maybe continuing COVID, we don't know. No, we don't know. But we're here. And it's so lovely to be here in this building to be hosted today by the, f the fellowship that uh, I understand that um, it's K. Sri Damananda founded this uh, association, this Buddhist association, oh, more than 70 years ago. Yeah? In Malaysia. In Malaysia, yeah. So how, um, you know, how wonderful. So we are sitting here continuing not only um, um, our teacher Thai, um, but also uh, Kesri Damananda. Yeah, his spirit is very much with us. Yeah. So when I, um, when I had this opportunity to um, be with the Sangha and uh, share uh, whatever comes through me, really. Um, it's very humbling, really. I feel very humbled. Um, I know that uh, there's so much that I don't know. And um, I always ask for the support of the Buddha and uh, of our respected Thai and now um, Damananda, yeah, and all of you. So as Brother Will shared, so much of, the, of what comes from this talk, we really are creating it together. We're co-creating it. And uh, when we're really present, uh, we're in communication with one another on a spiritual level. I've really had many experiences that prove that to me. And I'm sure you have too. Sometimes we think they're just, oh, just a coincidence. You know, when we're thinking about someone and then the phone rings and there they are, that kind of thing. Uh, because we, uh, I don't profess to really understand this, uh, what I'm going to say to really understand it, but I accept it, that it's true that the, the, the whole uh, notion of time and space is really an illusion. Hmm. But I don't exactly understand that. But then when we have these experiences, there it is, it's proof actually, that someone on the other side of the world can be thinking of us and we begin to think of them. Mm. So it's like that in this room today, too. So uh, some of you, I hope more than some of you, will hear things that uh, you might feel, wow, yeah, wow, wow, <laughs> oh, wow, uh, I needed to hear that, or yes, I understand that. So also, you know, the, the wisdom is in every one of us. So uh, I might say something that touches that, uh, and, then, and then there it is for you. Maybe you never thought of it quite like that, but you know that it's true because you already have it there in you. Mm. So I'm not exactly um, bringing you anything that you don't already have. Mm. But I find that to be humbling because that's happening with me too. So I very often uh, am surprised. Uh, in fact, I'm always surprised because I never prepare a talk. I just don't seem to be able to do that. So I gave up trying a long time ago. It was always a struggle and didn't feel natural. So I just sort of wait for something to come. So we might have a few moments of silence today, <laughs> more than you anticipated. <laughs> we'll see. But I think I already know that um, while I'm here in Malaysia, and I've been in Malaysia since Monday, and before that in Singapore, and uh, 12 days, and then before that a month, 
in Vietnam and Thailand. And before that, some months in the U.S. where I have family. Uh, that actually, there's not much difference at all. Of course, the food is different, and I'm loving it. Um, there are cultural differences, of course. But basically, you know, we're all one, and we're all, I think, experiencing a lot of, um, hmm, maybe challenges in our life. Uh, and it could be that for those of us who are waking up, the challenges feel even greater and the suffering feels more intense. I mean, you might be able to remember back before you ever thought to come to something like this today, when you maybe weren't aware of much of anything, you were just living the life. I mean, this was my story anyway. And I suppose I knew that was, uh, mm, life wasn't, uh, I didn't feel happy. I tried to believe that I was happy. Uh, I tried really hard. And every now and then I would have just a, a little moment of awareness of, I don't know, something's not right. But other than that, I just thought this is the world, this is the way it is, and we make the best of it. Uh, and then did something to distract myself. So I would be, you know, as I shared earlier with those of us who walked, um, I didn't walk, I pretty much ran everywhere. I was always out of breath from going too fast. And so I was, oh, and I was really good at multitasking. And, uh, and got a lot of um, praise for that at work. You know, I could be talking on the phone and writing a note totally unrelated to the conversation I was having on the phone while I was motioning to somebody else in the office and, uh, and then wondered why my back was in knots and I had so much tension in my neck and I had frequently had headaches. And, but I thought, well, this is just the life, you know. Everybody has this. And of course, most did seem to have it, the people I was around at the time. So I think we um, look back and, and we see, I see that part of my life anyway as one of just, I was in a bit of a dream, I think. And, uh, and then I had a sudden shock. And some of you, I'm sure, can relate to having had some sort of shocking news, something that wakes you up gives you a jolt and makes you see the world just, just for those moments. And something's changed. Something's shifted. And the life will never be the same. For me, it was the sudden death of my mother. Uh, so, of course, people had died around me. Uh, I had been to many funerals, even of young people. I had cried. Uh, I felt it. But it wasn't until the death of my mother, that I realized that people, uh, people I loved really died. And of course, then when I got into, uh, when I met Ty and I really got into the practice, then I, I had to sort of unlearn that and realize that, well, yes, the body dies, but we don't. We continue. So my mother is very much alive in me. And sometimes I feel I'm, I'm having a stronger a more wonderful relationship with her now, and she's been her, she's been gone in that form uh, for 33 years. But I have such a close relationship with her because she's right here. She's everywhere I go. I take her with me always, and my father also, and now Ty, and so many people living inside of me. Mm. But that really was quite a gift that she gave me, that she uh, passed in the way that she did. She was very strong and healthy, one year older than I am now. And uh, she didn't have any major health issues. Um, she just left one day. So people have a way of doing that, you know. Just uh, slip away sometimes. So it's uh, when we can remember that, we can be fully present, make a real effort to be fully present for those we love, because we never know, 
You know, death doesn't always give us a, a, any warning. It just comes. And uh, I had many years of uh, regret, sadness, sorrow, crying every day. So much of it, not not because she wasn't there in the moment with me, sitting beside me, but because I had not been there for her when I had been sitting there beside her when she had been on the planet, in that body, in that form, as my mother. I wasn't present. Actually, I don't think she was very present for me either. You know, we would sit and look at each other, and, but our minds would be running all over the place. So I think that's the... It's uh, very common and uh, in most of humanity. Ty says we, uh, there are a few of us a little bit everywhere. And by that he means people who are waking up, who are having aha moments, who have come out of the dream and realized that there is another way. And as Brother Will um, shared with us before the walk and also in here about slowing down, stopping, the importance of stopping, stopping, sitting still so that we can hear and know where we are and what's going on in our body and, and what's going on around us. And who's that sitting in front of us? And am I really listening to him, listening to her? Am I seeing her? So I think no matter where we're living on the planet, uh, so many of us, even those of us who are waking up, uh, our practice might not be so strong yet, and we're rushing, and we want to slow down, but the heaven energy is just so strong, you know? If you've not um, been uh, introduced to the Plum Village tradition, or maybe have not read anything by Thai or some of our other teachers, you might not be familiar with that term. I had to learn it, um, or I, I heard it for the first time in 1997. A habit energy, yeah, a way of being on autopilot. Uh, so when we're not mindful, when we're not in touch with our breath and body, uh, then we're really. Uh, we're not fully present, and uh, and we're on autopilot. Whatever we're saying, doing, thinking is just something from something from the past, something some conditioning of our mind, something we heard our mothers say, or something we heard the teachers say in school, and we took it on as the truth, and and then and now it, we think it's our truth. And so we just say it, or we just do it, a habit. Yeah. And sometimes it's not very pleasant, because we might have heard some, we might have heard some really angry words. Uh, we might have been around people who were discriminating against one another, who were caught in negative energies of jealousy and the, the competition. Ah, oh, goodness, the competition, you know. I never, even as a young person, I. I never played games that were very competitive, I don't think, because there was always a loser. So, even when I won, it was... The, the, the fun of winning was uh, dampened by the person in front of me who was looking sad, or the team, you know? So, uh, so I, I've, I've always felt like an athlete, but I've never really... <laughs> I've never really done any sports, and I think that was that was really it. That was so much of it. I was just never really attracted. Mm. I preferred to read, and uh, so I spent much more alone time. So the chaos of the world that we live in. so much suffering everywhere and it can be overwhelming and I, um, I know that many of us have that aspiration that we would like to maybe save the world <laughs> that was my aspiration 
And when I got into, um, when I met my first teacher, who was a psychotherapist, wise woman, very wise woman. And uh, so she asked me one day, because I was, I was very upset. I arrived at group therapy just so upset because I'd seen a very upsetting, I uh, had witnessed something very upsetting, a woman screaming and yelling and hitting her little boy who was, looked to be about four years old. And I couldn't do anything about that. I was in the parking lot of a supermarket and uh, I couldn't stop it. I knew, I was wise enough to know that I couldn't go over there and intervene. It would, might make it worse. And um, I, I, I would be shaming her for one thing. So I just tried to breathe and uh, went to group therapy and I was so shaken by that that I was the first one to share and <laughs> and I said, oh God, oh Judy, you just, oh, it was, it was terrible. She said, what is going on with you, Trish? And I said, oh, I just saw something. So I told her about it and I was literally crying and was just really, just, and crying, sad, angry, just uh, in a turmoil really of, of, of feelings, strong feelings. So it was a difficult moment for me. And, uh, and I said, I, I just, I can't take it anymore. I can't take it. It just seems that everywhere I look, I'm seeing so much suffering. And, uh, and she said, so what are you saying? And I said, well, I'm just saying that I don't, I, I can't tolerate this, you know. And she, I was so distressed. And she said, so are you saying, what are you saying, you want to save the world? And I looked at her and I said, well, yes, what's wrong with that? <laughs> and she stepped back and just looked at me and then said, work on yourself. There's your world. Work on yourself. There's your world. Mm. So it was a wake up moment for me. It was an aha moment. The, te the, the, the woman in the parking lot, the child, they were both teachers for me in that moment. Because I had seen them, because they had done that, she had done that, they were involved in that. As spirit, the spiritual beings that four year old and that mother were, are, were, we all are. Um, they were just human beings on the planet who had not had met the conditions yet to know to not do that. That you don't beat a four-year-old. Um, <clears throat> but because of their ignorance, uh, I had an aha moment. Yeah. For me in those years, I, I had to have that teacher. And I still have to have the teacher. You. I suppose sometimes I do have aha moments when I'm alone, read something, hear a bird, something, something happens, see something in the news, see something when I'm walking outside that gives me a, startles me for a moment and, and I can look at it and, ah. So I've had some really wonderful aha moments with little insects and butterflies and birds uh, that have, that I've seen as messengers, really. So, you know, there's uh, some, some people express it as, as within, so without, or as without, so within, that the world is a reflection. And of course, when I saw that uh, mother and that child in the parking lot, I was suffering a lot in my own life. So yes, everywhere I looked, I saw suffering because I was suffering. I was really caught in a lot. There was nothing wrong with any of that. It was just my, my path. You know, I had, to, I had to have the mud that we looked at today. Those of us who walked down to the lotus pond, beautiful lotuses blooming, lots of mud. Yeah. So the flowers have to have the mud. And, uh, I was just in those years, I'm talking about 1989, 1990, 1991, 92. Um, I was just beginning to come up out of the mud, you know, just beginning to, to get the stem and then the leaf and then the, you know, 
and then I suppose it was maybe around 1994 that um, I, I think a little blossom began to come up and uh, yeah so I I feel looking back on my life that uh, I really began to bloom in about 2005 when I moved to Vietnam I, I really yeah and since that time um, I've had experienced so much love in my life uh, so much peace and calmness. Uh, I don't have that anger that I had before. I still, of course, I'm still a human being, <laughs> still walking on the planet. It doesn't mean that I can't get angry. Uh, I have that seed of anger in me, just like we all do. We have a seed of everything, right? Uh, the first retreat I went to with Ty, 1997, a week. Uh, it was based on the 51 states of consciousness. That was the teaching, and it was specifically for people in, in uh, the healthcare professions, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, people in the caring professions. And I had not thought that I would ever go to that retreat. I'd never been to one with him. And as I shared with Marie Ann, Sister Marie Ann, as we walked along today, um, when a friend, dear friend at the time, she was later, I realized, a spiritual guide for me. She was the one who had taken me to the wise woman when I was really suffering from depression after the death of my mother. Um, she said, are you going to that retreat in Key West, Florida with Thich Nhat Hanh? I said, no. Why would I go to that? I can't even pronounce his name. <laughs> I've never read a book by him. I tried to read a book by him, but I thought it was kind of boring. I, could, I couldn't get it. I couldn't get it. I was very, uh, at that time, I had discovered Tibetan Buddhism. And I had gone to India, and I had lived with Tibetan nuns for some months in Dharamsala, or near Dharamsala. And I had had an audience with the Dalai Lama. And I had gone to big teachings where he taught thousands of people too. So I had six months of just, wow. But I didn't have a practice. I did not have a practice. I loved reading the books. And I was, while I was there, I was very happy. Uh, it was my first time really to be away from family, to be on my own. I was, how old was I? 54. So I've been a late bloomer. I was 54 years old when I went to India. Still married. My husband was confused but supportive. But he didn't understand what I was doing. I think he had some insight every now and then, but then his habit energies took over. Yeah. So I had come back and looking, had been told I needed a teacher, but uh, nothing happened really, and then the next year, Ty was giving that retreat, 51 States of Consciousness. So finally I said to my friend, no, I'm not going, I'm, it's for people in the caring, I'm not any of that. And she laughed. She said, oh, I think you qualify. And the reason for that was because I had been going to group therapy since 89, 1989, and this was 97, except for those six months in India. I was quite committed to waking up, and I did it by sitting in circles and uh, with seven other women. So, very intense time for me. A lot of pain and suffering coming up as I got in touch with uh, the myth. And I think we all uh, experience the myth of childhood. Uh, most of us, the people I've met anyway, and even recently, um, practitioners who have not been practicing very long and have not understood that that child is still alive, very much alive, just like my mother's alive in me. The child I was, the five-year-old, is alive in me. The five-year-old father, my, fi my father, at age five, is alive in me. 
Mm -hmm. So with the help of um, first my root guru, the, th uh, the psychotherapist, and then with the help of Thai and the Plum Village Sangha, I've come to understand that all those people are alive in me and that the childhood that I thought I had was a myth. And so I, how to get in touch with the reality that that child had experienced so that I could develop compassion for that child and for my father, for his, for his childhood and my mother's childhood and all the ancestors, my grandparents, whom I never really knew, but of course I know them because I know where they grew up. I know, I know the, the time, the location, the circumstances in that part of the world, what they would have been experiencing, what the culture was like. And, and then of course I knew my parents and they were the continuations of their parents. So as I learned that, I realized I have all those people in me and the path that I'm on is, <clears throat> it's huge. My purpose and yours, I would like to remind you, is huge and very doable with this practice because I never do anything just for myself and you don't either. So don't, don't ever fall into that uh, trap or that old way of thinking that, oh, or someone might even try to tell you, you're being very selfish. You're spending your Sunday morning like that instead of staying with the family and maybe all going out for breakfast together or whatever happens on Sunday mornings in your family. You might have somebody say that to you. Oh, you're being so selfish. Why don't you stay home and with the family today? But no. And I had that kind of experience. You're being very selfish going to Plum Village to stay three months during Christmas. You're leaving the family? Yes, I am. I said, I am. I mean, they were all grown. It wasn't like we were still, you know, playing Santa Claus. But, um, but even if they'd been small, I might have left. I don't know. Because I felt a calling. I felt called by the teacher. And, and the, I mean, I literally had heard it in my ear in Key West, Florida. What are you waiting for? The voice said. When are you going to come up here? That was my first eye contact with Ty. Now I don't know whether he was a ventriloquist or whether, or whether that voice came up in my mind. I, I don't know and I don't care. What I know is I heard it. And then he turned and walked away and my entire body was going like this. And I walked out and said, wow. <laughs> I am not going back to India. I have to go to Plum Village. That was, the, that was my experience. I don't have a choice. So I went home and told my husband, and he said, what? You were just gone for six months last year, and now you want to be gone for three months this year? And leaving the family during the holidays? And I said to him, I f I'm doing this. It's not just for me. I feel called, and, and I know that it's good for the family. It'll be good for the whole family. But he couldn't, he couldn't grasp that. He was too hurt. You know, he was, because what was I doing? I was kicking in all of his abandonment issues from childhood. Uh, you know, his father had killed himself when, when my husband was 13, had left him suddenly. Now the wife that he thinks is his, that stays with the family, she's leaving. And of course, children have we can feel abandoned as a child like that. You know, it doesn't have to be something so dramatic as a suicide. Uh, just somebody leaving home to go work somewhere or go work for the day. And a little child feels abandoned. Where's mom? Where's dad? You know, I'm all alone. Or, or the first day you take them to daycare, they feel abandoned. You know, they've never been left by their parents before. Suddenly, they're left in daycare with a bunch of strangers abandonment. So my husband was so caught in his own pain he couldn't understand um, me and uh, what I was doing. But what I think I want to say to you today is that this is not a time in history for the faint-hearted. It is not a time to hang back. 
It is not a time to play around with the practice, with your purpose in life. It's a huge purpose, and we're all needed. We're all being called to step up, to step up and do our part. We do our part for ourselves first, and then our families and our communities. And that ripple effect can change the entire world. So that's how we contribute to the issues of climate change and war and all these things that have always been there because they're in us. So we, we do the transforming here. We do the healing here by getting in touch with all of this that's in here. The pain and suffering and the happiness of our ancestors. It's all here. Our blood ancestors, our spiritual ancestors. It's purposeful work. There's no better work. There's nothing else that really matters in my mind. Nothing. Yeah. That doesn't mean that we don't enjoy and, uh, and still go to breakfast on Sunday morning or whatever morning it is. I've gone to a lot of places since I've been on this trip. It's been wonderful and to have that, the friendship, the fellowship, uh, the laughing, the being together. I mean, this is happiness. This is, but for me, it's, it's uh, my greatest happiness is being with uh, people on the path. Yeah, because I need the support and we each need that. So Sangha, community. We very much have to have community. Be willing to sit in circles. I don't know if those of you who are not um, Plum Village people, whether you, um, you know, in the Plum Village tradition, whether you practice sitting in a circle, listening to one another, practicing deep listening, loving speech, uh, but it's, I found it to be so essential. Uh, it's, it's where I've done my healing and transforming in circles. And also on the massage table. I never failed to, miss, to, to, to mention this because for me it was extremely important. I had so much locked up, you know, so everything's, everything, it, everything is in every cell of our body. Mother Earth, the sun, the air, the, everything. And all of the ancestors, the teachers, all of you now, we're part of each other. But from the so much locked locked in from the past, you know. So I had a, you could say I had a suit of armor on in 1989, and when I got the news that my mother had had, they'd found her dead. My heart, everything. It was, I've never really found the words to describe. But it was like my whole being just flew apart. It just was flying out, and it's like some film you've seen of space, where everything was just flying out. I was breaking apart. And my husband, in his wisdom, knew just what to do. He just wrapped me up, because I wanted to run. It was so painful. And he held me really tight. So he literally held me together. He brought me back in. And then suddenly there was my daughter doing the same thing. She was 20 at the time. And, uh, and I said, oh, the world will never be the same. My heart, I feel my heart's opened. Yeah. Oh. But our heart can close back up if we, uh, if we don't have a practice. So I was fortunate to find the community of people who were trying to wake up in psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. And then I was very fortunate to so I had that then interim when I went to India. And I can't say I really felt community there. Uh, it was all so, everything so very different and I was alone and I felt that aloneness a lot. Uh, I, because I didn't have a practice and I, of course I didn't speak Tibetan and there I was in a Tibetan nunnery. Um, it was quite a wonderful experience and one that I needed. I really obviously needed that. I wanted to be around strong women. And uh, it took me a long time actually to understand even why I had gone. 
but that was it. My mother had been a very strong woman. My parents were farmers, and I had grown up with that. But then the life had taken over, and I'd married well, and I was really living the high life. And I lost touch. Yeah, I lost touch with that simpler life. So I was around a lot of women who probably were experiencing life like I was, but we didn't talk to each other about that. But, you know, I was, I was just in that world where, honestly, I, I knew women who would go to the manicurist if they broke one nail, just to get, you know, to get that nail fixed. Yeah, I mean, crazy. That's the crazy world. That's the insanity of the world. So people with money suffer a lot. I'm here, I, I have experienced both now, and I see that, that uh, money does not bring happiness. Because what you have to do to get that money doesn't bring happiness. Uh, it takes us away uh, from the simpler things in life, the beauty of washing a dish or cooking a meal for our family. Or, you know, when you can have a cook do it all, wow. Well, I never had that, thank goodness. I had, my, I had some boundaries, you know. I still had that farm girl in me, and that I was around all this other. And they were great teachers for me. So I had to go to that to leave that. And when I went to India, I, re I realized some years later, well, I was looking for those strong women again. And I found them in the Tibetan nuns who'd walked for two years from, from eastern Tibet down through the mountains of Nepal to reach the Dalai Lama in India. They walked for two years. I knew a nun who'd lost half her foot to frostbite. Another one who'd seen her sister drown as they were trying to cross a river in Nepal. And they did it. So they were tough. So I was happy to be in that energy even though I couldn't have a conversation with them. The best was, Trish, you nun, you nun, Trish, they would say. <laughs> they shaved my head. Yeah. We don't do that in Plum Village, they, the, the monastics, <laughs> so don't get worried. Uh, actually, I would like to have a haircut, but, but not, not, not shaved. But uh, you can imagine that word got back to, uh, to the community where I'd been living, that this 54-year-old woman had exchanged all her fine clothes for, you know, for hiking clothes. And the refugees looked better than I did in, in, in India. I'm not kidding. I, because I, I was concerned. I didn't want to look good, you know, because I'd heard so many terrible things about what might happen to a Western woman in India traveling alone. So I, uh, yeah. Uh, but I have to admit that it, it kind of hurt when, when someone called me sir one day. <laughs> <laughs> but that again, I, that helped me to understand even something so simple as why had I allowed them to shave my head. I mean, it was sort of done as a, I don't know, it was like a bit of a lark. But I said, okay, we'll do it. And, uh, but then, you know, cause and effect. So if you want to know why something has happened, look at the effect. It might take a few years to figure it out, you know, for it to, for, to have that aha moment. But when that guy called me sir, and I had been a pretty little girl, and then a woman who worked hard to look pretty, and still do a little some of that, um, or work at it a little bit, um, <clears throat> because I live in the world, and I don't want to be shocking people all the time. Um, <laughs> But that, when he called me sir, that helped me to understand why I wanted that haircut, why I wanted, I wanted to be seen as a human being. And that had not been possible in my life. I had been objectified, and I don't think it's any different here in Malaysia or any other part of the, well, maybe in somewhere in the jungle, but uh, mostly in our world, you know, it's, everything is sexualized. Uh, People are seen as sexual objects, especially young people. And, and you learn to see yourself that way. So you see yourself as separate. You know, I'm just an object over here. One to hopefully someone admires me or likes the way I look. But this is, none of this is who we are, you know. So I just wanted to be a human being. 
I wanted to be treated like that. I didn't want the, all this other to get in the way. So I felt freer. But then, of course, I went back to the world and let my hair grow some. But never long again. Never long again. Yeah. So why don't we have a drink of water? Because I would like one. So maybe we can all have our drink of tea. Yeah. Just sit and breathe together and have our tea just for a moment. Yeah. <laughs> 